Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's webinar, Soil Carbon for Your Farm Business, uh, the science of soil carbon, brought to you as part of the Central West Local Land Services, Ag Services, ADAPT project. This project is supported through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. Today, we welcome Dr. Susan Orgel, a soil scientist with New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and leader of Soils R&D South, and Luke Signor, who is with the Australian Government's Clean Energy Regulator and the Assistant Manager of the Savannah Agriculture and Soil Carbon Credits Team, or the SAS. Before we get into the webinar, let me introduce myself and run through some housekeeping. Uh, I'm Rowan Leach, uh, the Regional Ag Land Care Facilitator with Central West Local Land Services, and thanks for joining us today. We've had a fantastic response from you, the audience, with over 100 registrations. So this just highlights the, uh, the importance of these topics, I think. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples with us today. Assisting me today is Nerilee Brennan, the team leader of Ag Services in Central West uh, LLS. If you need help with anything throughout the webinar, please contact Nerilee, whose phone number is on the bottom of your screen. On the right hand side of you, uh, you'll see the, con the control panel, which allows you to actively participate in today's webinar. You can use the orange button to collapse and expand this control panel during the presentation. All participants are currently muted and this webinar will be recorded today and made available to everyone who has registered. Um, so this here is the, the orange button. Uh, any handouts, we don't have any of those today. Everyone's muted. This is, submit your questions in this uh, questions panel. Uh, so before I introduce our, uh, sorry, everyone, I'm just clicking through. Before I introduce Suze, our first speaker, I'm just gonna throw to a quick poll. Uh, this will help with our presenters uh, to find out any of the, um, just to help with their um, knowledge for today. So if you could just fill those out, yeah, our options, those are, those are coming in. Cattle, sheep, cropping, mixed farming and other. I know there's probably, it's good to see. I didn't think we'd have too many of the other categories. So, um, I've got about 70% voted uh, and we'll probably just have that open for another five seconds before we close it. We've got about 40 here with us today uh, attending. So thank you very much for your, uh, for your time. Keep that for another five seconds. Three, two, one. And I'll just share those results. So obviously in the central west here, big mixed mix farming. So Suze and Luke, hopefully you uh, have got that um, for, your, for your presentations. Um, so I'd like to introduce our first presenter for today. Uh, Dr. Susan Ogle is a soil scientist with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and is based in Wagga Wagga at the Ag Institute. Susan is passionate about delivering farm ready research focusing on strategies to increase soil carbon and nutrient cycling in agricultural soil. Her current projects include grazing and nutrient management to increase soil carbon using remotely sensed imagery to identify zones to increase soil carbon sequestration and developing metrics to value the benefits of improved soil management. I'll hand over to you, Suze, uh, who will start today's presentation. Great, thanks, Rowan. Sorry, just making you the panelist now, Suze. Excellent, give me two seconds just to get set up. Okay. 
it just takes a bit of time, sorry, for my computer to recognise it. I'm assuming people can only see my desktop at the at the moment. Yeah, that's right. Just your desktop. Yeah. See how messy it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get going. Okay. Very Thank good. you very much for the um the invite to speak today, and thanks for those of you joining us online. I um as Rowan said, my name's Suze, and I'm based at the Wagga Wagga Ag Institute with New South Wales DPI. And my area of research is soil carbon, but I just wanted to start by saying how I got into this area of research. And I think it's thanks to the great producers that I've worked with for many years. So when I first started with DPI about 15 or so years ago, I um, was running soil health workshops and some of the people on the line may have um, attended some of those workshops. And basically we'd kind of talk about soil properties, we'd get into soil pits, we'd do soil testing, and then we'd do this um, soil test analysis and we talk about basically the recipe to grow plants, right? So you want to grow crop of wheat, you want to kind of improve your subclover in your, um, your pasture, so what are you going to apply? And it was a bit of a recipe-based science and it was based on evidence and, and, and obviously um, well-received. But the questions I'd always get towards the end of those four workshops were around soil biology and soil carbon and energy flows in soil. And what about kind of this black box of microbial mobilization of nutrients? And it kind of led me down the pathway to do my PhD while I was still working with DPI on soil carbon. And I think what we've done, what we know now, I guess, is just enhancing soil health through building organic matter in soil underpins our production systems. There's absolutely no debate about that. Um, and there's some really solid evidence about ways that we can achieve that. Now online, I know we've got people from a range of different backgrounds with lots of different expertise. So what I wanna do in today's webinar is kind of build on all of your knowledge and understanding, but start from the fundamentals and think about the flows of carbon around the landscape. So the way that carbon gets into our soil is through the process of photosynthesis. So green photosynthesizing um, plants in our landscape, drawing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They use uh, water and energy from sunlight to create uh, glucose or energy for plant growth. And one of the byproducts of those we also kind of benefit from in being oxygen. So we've got this, what's called, being referred to as the liquid carbon pathway. So it goes from a uh, gas in the atmosphere and then gets sequestered into the plant in a liquid form and can be transferred into a solid form as well. So above ground we see that as leaves and litter and manure if we've got grazing livestock from that survey we can see that we've got lots of livestock people online as well. Below ground that's in terms of um, roots and root exudates. So what root exudates are is they're the carbohydrate rich substances that leak out of plant roots. The reason the plants will, I guess, use carbon and leak it out the roots is to get microbes to come and live close to them. So we've got our plant roots exuding up to 30% of the total carbon that gets sequestered by that plant. So it's a really important energy transfer and arrangement that plants have with microbes. And that's because plants know that if they've got healthy microbes living within the rhizosphere, they can access more nutrients, they can explore a greater volume of soil to um, acquire moisture and nutrients as well. Um, and they can also be, be more resilient. So they're more buffered against some of those changes in soil chemistry, but also within the soil environment in terms of fluctuations in temperature and moisture as well. So root exudates are a really important, I guess, partnership or uh, energy transfer between plants and microbes. And our microscopic livestock in our system, so the organisms that live in our soil uh, are one of the keys to not only building soil carbon, to making sure that we've got functional soil carbon. So our above and below ground organic matter, uh, once it's in the soil, we refer to this as obviously soil organic matter, and it can go through several different pathways. So it can be protected within aggregates or soil crumbs. So um, this um, 
is basically where you've got fresh labile organic matter that gets wrapped up nice and tightly within a soil aggregate and that then is protected within the soil and if that's under a perennial pasture we know that really labile organic matter that in the lab we might say only is going to last for kind of weeks to months to maybe a year in fact once it's aggregate protected in the soil profile it can last up to decades and some of our work has shown that aggregate protected organic matter can last in the soil for um, 40 to 60 60 years, so it's not insignificant. We've also got, as I said, this important microbial population that's in the soil that also forms part of that organic matter pool. So microbes use organic matter for energy. Uh, and what we contribute from microbes that builds that humic pool within the soil as well. So humus is basically dead microbes and microbial detritus. So the way that we build that humus is by having more microbial activity within the soil. We also have chemically protected organic matter. So these are organic molecules that form associations with minerals in the soil that protect it from further decomposition. The other chemical form of um, organic matter stabilisation is through char and also so through fine bits of charcoal and also through that building of humus. Uh, when we look at these conceptually within the soil, we can fractionate it out and say, right, we've got our humus. So that's kind of our big nutrient reservoir where a lot of carbon and other nutrients are stored. Remember, that's kind of microbial products. Um, we've got our particulate or labile carbon. That's the organic matter that turns over quite rapidly, very management sensitive, but really important for driving those microbial processes. And then we've also got charcoal in the soil. So really fine bits of charcoal, which in some Australian soils can account for up to 35% of that total organic pool. But this is a flow around the landscape, right? So we've also got plants and the soil microbes themselves respiring. So we've got carbon dioxide leaving the soil. Um, and in addition to that, um, we can have carbon loss via soil erosion. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the carbon is going to make it back up into the atmosphere, but it means that with soil particles that leave that site, um, they can be enriched with soil carbon, which represents a loss as well. So this is the key to my whole presentation, this slide. It's about managing the flows of carbon around the landscape, not just the stocks. And it's the size of the arrows that matter. So it's completely consistent with increasing um, productivity. So the more solar panels you have on your farm, the more photosynthesizing um, plants that you've got on your for farm. And then for, the, for livestock grazers online, that's about having actively growing plants as well because they'll be sequestering more carbon, exuding more root exudates and sloughing more roots, so contributing to that organic matter pool in the soil, uh, then the more carbon you can accumulate. So if I was me, and I frequently am, I'd be saying, okay, well, all I'm trying to do is basically grow more biomass and that's probably what you should be doing um, with your farm management goals anyway. So that flow of carbon around the landscape is the same in this paddock here out at Beckham. It's the same in this paddock here at Burrawa, and it's the same in this Mitchell grass paddock out in the rangelands. So this is the same flow that happens on your farm already. Now I've used a couple of terms um, interchangeably now. So I've referred to soil organic matter and soil organic carbon. So soil organic matter um, by definition is less than two millimetres um, in diameter and it can consist of partially decomposed organic residues. So think about kind of visible bits of organic matter in the soil, microbes, very small, can't see them, super important, uh, humus, the material that gives the soil that dark staining and charcoal. But realistically for a farm manager, so this is what kind of some soil scientists can get a bit obsessed with because the less than two millimetre fraction is the fraction that is most related to the soil properties that soil organic matter influences. So yes, very important. The other reason it's important is because we can standardise the analysis across laboratories, also very important. But in terms of a farm manager, it doesn't matter if a piece of organic matter, so a piece of root, for example, that's wrapped around nice stable aggregates is 10 millimetres, 10 centimetres, 10 metres in your paddock and some fungal hyphae, for example, would even exceed that in perennial pastures. Um, it still plays a really important role in the accumulation of carbon in the soil. So there, see that? I used the word carbon. Now what carbon is, it's the measurable fraction of soil organic matter. Now we know that organic matter is approximately 58% carbon 
that means that there's a whole lot of other stuff in, in organic matter. And for farmers, this is really important. So the rest is made up of these important nutrients that we manage day to day in terms of nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and a whole heap of other trace elements that are important for plant growth. When you test your soil, um, send your soil sample off for a test through the lab, um, the results will come back usually as soil organic carbon percentage, which is refers to the total organic carbon in the soil. So that's the char, the humus and the particulates, that total pool. It can also be reported as grams per 100 grams of soil and that's it's just an interchangeable unit. Now, the standard that we recommend um, and the national protocol is to use dry combustion methods. Um, the other term that we will see throughout this presentation is soil carbon stocks. So this is where we talk about tons of carbon per hectare. And generally we report this to 30 centimetres because that's the international standards for reporting soil organic carbon. So the way that we actually get soil organic carbon stocks is we need the concentration of carbon in soil, the grams per 100 grams. We need to know the depth over which that sample was collected. And we also need to know the bulk density of the soil. So bulk density of the soil is the mass of soil for a given volume. Now, the other unit that we talk about are carbon dioxide equivalents. So one tonne of carbon in your soil is equivalent to 3.66 tonnes of carbon dioxide. So just run through a very quick example. And the main reason I put this in here is so that if you get the notes later, you can kind of see, right, that's actually pretty simple to calculate. Now for trading, there's a couple of other things that get included in this calculation, um, specifically around gravel concentration, but let's just run through a quick calculation that you could do at home. So if we knew that your, um, you had 2.7% carbon in the top 10 centimetres of your soil and your bulk density was 1.03, then your soil carbon stocks are calculated by the concentration multiplied by the depth multiplied by the bulk density which gives us 27.81 tonnes of carbon per hectare. So when we look at it to 30 centimetres I generally like to still take soil samples in layers because I'm interested in other factors that are kind of going on in those layers. Um, so what you could do is the same calculation but for the different layers if you and then add them up to give you the soil carbon stocks to 30 centimetres. So why are we interested in soil carbon? Um, well, there's just these immense undeniable production benefits around nutrient cycling, water infiltration and storage, and all of these cycles which underpin plant growth and plant quality, okay, which is really important obviously for crop production, but also live produ livestock production as well. So let's just focus in on a couple of these factors. So we know that um, increasing soil organic carbon is correlated with increasing the cation exchange capacity of soil. So cation exchange capacity of soil is the sum of all the cations that are in the soil. So I refer to them as the EMs, so calcium, potassium, magnesium, sodium, the one that stands out that isn't an EM is aluminium. Um, and so if we look at the sum of all those cations in the soil, that's your cation exchange capacity. Um, it's an inherent indicator of fertility in the soil and it's influenced by two things. It's influenced by the amount of clay in the soil because clay has these negative exchange plates on the surfaces which can hold on to cations and it's also influenced by um, organic carbon in the soil because organic carbon can do the same thing in terms of holding on to the cations. So a 1% increase in soil organic carbon can give us up to 90% increase in cation exchange capacity depending on what the soil type is. So what I like to do is get okay Normally, I'd be actually presenting in person, but for all of you online, just imagine you're sitting in a room full of really engaged producers who are loving hearing about soil carbon. The only difference is you're sitting at home or on your tractor listening to it. Um, so you're in this big room. Now, this room is our soil, right? Now, we're all sitting down on chairs at tables. Now, if we all stood up, now the chairs in this room are the exchange surfaces so these negative surfaces on our clays, okay? So if we all stood up and where are all the cations now? Magnesium, potassium, mag um, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and aluminium. 
Now, if we removed, remember, the, the amount of exchange plates within that kind of in our room is the amount of chairs. If we removed half the chairs, so we reduced the amount of organic carbon in the soil, okay, we'd have half of the people in the room not being able to sit down when we ask everyone to sit down, right? So they're now in the soil solution. That can be lost. They can be leached through or lost, um, lost within the soil solution. Okay. If we then brought in more chairs, though, by increasing soil organic carbon, we can retain more nutrients, more cations in the soil. So it's really important. We can't easily con change clay concentration, but what we can influence is the amount of organic carbon in the soil. Um, now, organic matter is also a really important reservoir of other nutrients. So notice there I said organic matter, because remember organic matter is 58% carbon, 42% other stuff. So a 1% increase in soil organic carbon in the top 10 centimetres of a loam soil represents a tonne of nitrogen, over 200 kilos of phosphorus and 170 kilos of sulphur. So we could actually put a value on that. So it's really important in terms of that nutrient acquisition. And nearly every nutrient that you apply to your soil, be it from a bag or squeezed out of a chook or an animal, um, needs to first pass through a micro to become plan available. So this is where we come back to this functional carbon being really important, having um, a microbially healthy soil underpinning our production systems. Now, what about water holding capacity? So we hear a lot about the role of uh, increasing soil organic carbon for water infiltration, but it also, in, it also increases the sponginess of the soil. So a 1% increase in soil organic carbon can give us up to a third more capacity to hold on to water, which is really important. And again, this comes down to the microbial um, activity within the soil. So as, as microbes move through the soil, they create channels and pathways so that plant roots can explore the soil, air and water can move through the soil. Um, they also excrete sticky substances which stick our soil particles together, which are really important for enhancing stability. Um, fungal hyphae can wrap around soil aggregates and promote soil uh, stability. And this is all driven by the energy we put in the soil in terms of soil organic matter. So you can see through a few of these examples, there's a, a really significant ecosystem service provision um, that we're supplying. So around prom promoting and supporting food and fibre production, clean air, clean water, regulating the impact of natural disasters. There's also this huge genetic in, uh, resource that is within our soil. And there's these emerging opportunities, so through carbon trading or through um, green market premiums that are coming online now, um, which make it really good business sense to be increasing your soil organic carbon. So it's important to remember as well that soils will vary in their capacity to sequester and protect uh, carbon. So it's about this balance. So when we look at that number on our soil test result, it's a result of the amount of organic matter that's supplied. So the amount of green solar panels and the actively, uh, the active input of organic matter to the soil and the balance of that with the loss of, of carbon through decomposition and erosion. So remember decomposition can also be a really good thing because that's where we get the nutrient provision uh, and the structural um, enhancement through that microbial activity. So this process is going to be modified by a couple of things. The type of organic matter. So if we're growing lots of legumes, we're providing lots of nitrogen to the soil, which can increase carbon sequestration. It's also influenced by the soil's capacity to store carbon. So remember, clays can act um, as a bit of a sponge for organic carbon molecules as well. So they can hold onto and protect organic carbon in these organomineral associations. Um, Different clay minerals have different capacity to do that. Where we're putting carbon in the profile can influence um, how long carbon can stay there for, as can soil structure in terms of that aggregate protection. Now, these are the same factors that drive productivity. Some of them we can change. We can influence the type of organic matter. We can have practices which enhance soil structure and some we can't easily change. So for example, um, clay type or soil, or soil depth. Now the next slide, I've got two minutes left, and the next couple of slides I wanna show you is um, some examples of carbon sequestration rates which are in the published literature. 
And um, again, I guess the benefit of this slide will be if you kind of look at it and reflect on it later, but I want to stress that there are management practices that can increase soil organic carbon? Absolutely. Will you make millions out of it? Maybe not. Should you do it in any way? Definitely. So what we're going to see here is we're going to have some management actions in the first column. Then there's the carbon sequestration rate. So that's the tonnes of carbon per hectare which are sequestered across 30 centimetres of soil. The years over which that trial was conducted so that that sequestration um, was recorded and the reference because I'm a soils nerd. Now, what's important about the years is what you'll often see when you change practice um, and, be, and you'll see what some of those practices will be in a minute, that you get this initial really sharp increase in soil organic carbon uh, and then it plateaus out. Now, some of the producers I work with who have been doing really great innovative things for a long time on top of their grazing management, nailing it with nutrient management, they've kind of had that increase and now they're plateauing. So what they're looking for is the next step right and you can get that next step so it might be through um, a different intervention it might be through working with microbes it might be through um, a change management but it's all about I guess seeing where you are on that sequestration um, curve so some of the management practices that we've got published data on are things like liming, nutrient management, um, the timing and duration of grazing management. And so this is New South, New South Wales data, the application of organic amendments. So bringing carbon to the site and then looking at carbon sequestration beyond the amount of carbon that you've put in the soil. Um, and if we look at what these are, so it kind of ranges from 0.1 tonnes per hectare up to two and a half tonnes per hectare. So you probably, that, that trial was for five years, you probably wouldn't keep maintaining it at that higher rate, but most certainly um, you can get that kind of big increase in the first few years. Um, but what I want you to have a look at, all of these practices are about growing more biomass. So it's about productivity. So healthy, actively growing plants that aren't kind of hitting the barrier with soil constraints can potentially sequester more carbon. So in terms of cropping, um, we've got also things like um, the, the, I guess the key is around um, pasture phases. So giving the soil the ability to not only enhance soil structure, but build up nitrogen and carbon. So soil organic matter within the pasture phase. Um, looking at nutrient management. And in some cases, it's about um, looking at conversion or lengthening the amount of pasture phase. So this is just looking at carbon sequestration. Um, certainly the application of nutrients and strategic management of stubble can also increase soil organic carbon sequestration in, um, in cropping systems. But sometimes we're faced with this fact that you don't get an increase in soil organic carbon despite best management. So just to finish on this, sometimes what can happen is you can have these really large background levels of soil organic carbon, which mean that the increase that you're getting, because it might only be incremental, may not be detected, or if it's detected, it might be not significant. Um, so it's important to monitor and to look at the trends as well. Are you increasing soil organic organic carbon over time. Now, the amount of carbon sequestration might be the same, but your background level might be really high. And so very quickly, imagine in front of you, you've got two buckets, right? They're both empty. Then I come along and I fill one bucket up with sand. You look, you go, right, one bucket's full of sand. Now I come along with a cup of sand and I, if I pour that cup of sand, so it's exactly the same amount of sand in this cup, if I poured it into the bucket that's already full of sand, you wouldn't see it, would you? No, you wouldn't see it. That same amount of sand into the empty bucket, you'd detect it and go, yeah, there's a cup of sand that's in there now. Okay, think about the same way in your paddocks. If you've got a perennial pasture paddock that's just pumping, you're on top of grazing management, on top of nutrient management, some of those increases you might not be able to detect because you've already got a large amount of carbon there. Okay, soil type and climate are major drivers of product production but also organic matter turnover and sometimes that's why we don't see that increase despite best management. You've got your microbes turning over the organic matter so it's a functioning soil and it's a healthy soil but you may not detect that change. Other cases it's um, nutrient deprived or perhaps it's drought affected and also you've got this immense amount of spatial variability that you need to uh, account for within your production systems and in some cases soil organic carbon might not be sensitive 
it's sensitive enough to detect your management change in the short term, but certainly um, it is something that you should be monitoring. So we've got these range of more, um, strategies to increase all organic carbon. For pastures, it's about grazing management. It's about having legumes um, for nitrogen and um, a healthy functioning system for nutrient acquisition. For crops, it might be about looking at tinkering with the pasture phase, minimising tillage, retaining stubble, and in some cases, some strategic tillage as well. In general, what we need to focus on is making sure that there's enough nutrients for the plants and enough organic matter going in for the microbes to build humus and they need nutrients also. Overcoming soil constraints um, and in some cases, perhaps it's looking at changing practice or adding carbon rich materials. The new exciting stuff is in multi-species planting biostimulants and microbes that are designed or I guess preferentially selected to store stable carbon and there's heaps of exciting stuff happening in this space as well. So in summary, carbon cycling on your farm already, what you can influence is the size of the arrows moving through that system. To change uh, that carbon cycle, influence it and sequester more, you may need to change practice. So you need to think about on your farm, what's your biggest lever? Is it soil acidity? Is it phosphorus deficiency? Are you not on top of your grazing management? And that's where you should start. Um, definitely there's going to be some soil and climate factors that li limit carbon sequestration, but producers are the cleverest people that I've ever met. So I reckon um, they're very agile at working within their environment. The benefits of soil organic matter, there's no arguments about that. It's about soil fertility and uh, soil structure and the microscopic livestock are the key to that balance. And lastly, to increase soil organic carbon on your farm, you've got to consider what's the right practice for you in the right place at the right time. Wow, that was great. Thanks, Suze. Um, I really, I really enjoyed the uh, the chairs uh, analogy for uh, for for nutrients. It kind of makes it quite simple, doesn't it? Um, just before we go to some questions from the audience, um, I've just got one for you quickly. How quickly can we rebuild our carbon? Like, if our if our levels have really dropped down and um yeah and how, how quickly can we can we turn this around oh man in years like this oh sorry i can't couldn't hear you that last bit but what we've got now is we've got prime current sequestration conditions right we're coming off the back of really um, dry period so we've got nutrients that have built up within the soil because we didn't have those actively growing plants we've got soil moisture um, and so that's where we get that rapid increase but the increase can happen within a matter of years and it just depends what your baseline level is so if you're starting from a really low level then you'll be able to detect a significant change in the short term right but it does take a while for that soil health that microbial component to build up but certainly we're talking years not decades yeah cool uh, and just another one from me this is I'm a bit greedy here um, so if we've got say two paddocks side by side same soil type like a, a clay out at Warren for example and one paddock is say half a percent organic carbon and the paddock right next door to it is say one percent how much more nitrogen or and minerals are going to be mineralized by that sort of that higher soil carbon paddock is that something that we can we can kind of put a figure on or is that well, we could you could have asked me that beforehand <laughs> so i could have had a good crack at it no you could work it out right you could work it out yeah. but i don't have the answer for you off the top of my head <laughs> no that's that's fine that's fine <laughs> and i guess it also comes down to kind of whether or not your one percent carbon is um, a good balance between humus and particulate, so that labile carbon. But if your 1% carbon is all lab mostly labile and you've got really low humus levels, then what can happen when you start influencing um, nutrients in that soil that you can actually kind of start to burn off and you can lose that labile carbon really, really rapidly. So it is about the balance between, I guess, building humus and also building labile organic carbon. Yeah, great. Well, uh, we haven't had too many 
more come in. Um, so we might, while we're giving people a chance to sort of digest that and uh, let their brains leak back, push back into their ears, uh, we might uh, we might push on with Luke Signor's uh, presentation. So thanks for that. Thanks so much, Suze. Um, we might come back to you with some more questions at the end. Uh, hopefully you can all see my screen. Sorry, hearing that I'm a little bit slow. Uh, so time for our next speaker. Luke Signor works for the Clean Energy Regulator and based in Canberra and is the Assistant Manager for the Savannah Agriculture and Soil Carbon Credits team. Luke and his team are responsible for the assessment of different carbon trading methodologies, in particular soil carbon. So I'll now hand over to Luke. And also the proud owner of a pretty pretty handy moustache. So uh, thanks Luke, I'm just uh, clicking over. Hopefully that's... Um, Thank you very you much, Rob. I just realized now, I Luke. was still muted, so. Thank you for that lovely introduction and thank you for introducing the moustache. Um, one second and I can present my screen. Do you need to give me that option, Rowan, or can I just do that myself? Sorry, Luke, yeah, you. I've given you the, the wrong control. Far away. All good. I think we're good. And there we go. Fantastic. So, yes, thank you. I am Luke Signal from the uh, Savannah Agriculture and Soil Carbon Credits team at the Clean Energy Regulator. Uh, we're an independent uh, federal uh, agency as, uh, as part of the uh, Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. Um, today, I'm going to be discussing specifically the Carbon Credits Carbon Farming Initiative Measurement of Soil Carbon Sequestration in Agricultural Systems Methodology Determination 2018. It is a mouthful. I'll refer to it as the measurement method for the rest of this talk. Um, what I'll be talking about uh, is what the method is, uh, what sort of activities are eligible, which ones are Ill, uh, ineligible, uh, how you can measure the soil carbon abatement, what are some of the benefits of having such a project on your property, uh, right through to receiving Australian carbon credit units, known as ACUs, and how you can turn those into money. Uh, I will finish with an overview of the steps to participate if you're interested in starting such a project with the Emissions Reduction Fund. Uh, I won't be getting into the specifics of the soil carbon sequestration. Uh, Sue's fantastic presentation just before me uh, sort of goes into that a lot more and she explains it much better than I ever could. Uh, but I'll be happy to answer some, um, some questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, if there is a pressing question that you want answered uh, while I'm speaking, uh, Rowan, feel free to um, send that through. Uh, there are two other soil carbon methodologies that are uh, with the Clean Energy Regulator. Uh, one is no longer eligible for receiving new applications, and that's the sequestering carbon in soils <coughs> in grazing systems, uh, which was opened in 2014. Uh, and when the 2018 method was published, it was then closed. So it's a very similar uh, uh, methodology for sequestering soil carbon and measuring that increase and in, uh, obtaining ACUs from it. Um, but since the 2018 method is now the valid one, uh, it's got some additional flexibility that the 2014 method didn't have, so uh, we no longer allow registrations under that method. Um, there is also a what we refer to as the um, the modelled method, which is the estimating sequestration of carbon in soil using default values. Uh, 
We don't currently have any projects registered under this particular method, uh, but it is a slightly more conservative version. Uh, there is no specific measurement that's involved. Um, it's based on modeling uh, and it may be um, worthwhile considering if uh, the costs of the um, measurement method um, are a little uh, too high. Uh, so first, what are the methods? The, uh, the methods relate to the carbon farming activities that lead to carbon abatement and can renew ACUs. Across the whole of the ERF, we have 34 methods and 18 of those are carbon farming methods. Each method has a simple method guide, which is a good place to start as it takes you step by step uh, through how to register a project, how to run it, and how to report on a soil carbon project. Uh, the measurement method um, 2018 also has an explanatory statement uh, which gives additional details regarding each part of the determination itself. Uh, it sort of gives background information of why the requirement was published in the first place and the intent behind that requirement. It's important that you understand the requirements of the method before you decide to register a project, as well as any requirements of the Carbon Farming Initiative Act regulations and the rule. Uh, to help on our website you will find in addition to the simple method guides, sampling guidance and guidance on meeting these requirements. I'll provide some additional links at the end of this presentation specifically for the soil carbon method we're looking at today. The measurement of soil carbon sequestration in agricultural systems method uh, credits the measured increases in soil carbon as a result of one or more new or materially different management activities in grazing, bare fallow or cropping land that store carbon in that land. Soil carbon stocks must be estimated using speci specified soil sampling methods. I'll talk about uh, soil sampling more later on. These are the eligible activities. Uh, I won't go through each of them specifically, but uh, you can find these uh, listed in the method under section seven. Uh, you can see that these uh, are very similar to the activities that Sue gave in her presentation as well. Uh, while there are activities that we consider eligible, there are several activities that we do not allow. Um, uh, such as destocking of the land or applying ineligible non-synthetic fertilizers uh, as part of developing your project um, a, a, an independent professional in the field must be able to attest that these particular actions are not going to be conducted on your land we also have restricted activities <clears throat> pardon me uh, these are not so much uh, prohibited, uh, but can be conducted uh, under specific regulations. Uh, again, you'll be able to see those um, in the method, um, specifically under section 12. So the, uh, the 2018 method may be a good fit for you or your business if you are looking to store carbon in uh, soil in a grazing or cropping system, including perennial woody horticulture, <coughs> I mean horticulture, willing to undertake one or new more land management activities to increase soil carbon, willing to measure that increase in soil carbon at least once every five years, and are willing to maintain the stored carbon for at least 25 years after the first ACU is issued. Uh, so once you know that this method is right for you and you decide to register a project, you will need to undertake uh, the following actions at each stage of your soil carbon project. Currently, there are a number of eligibility requirements that must be met for a project to be declared, including land usage for the baseline, which is the period of 10 years prior to the lodgement of your application, newness requirements and regulatory additionality, you're welcome to get in touch with myself and my team to discuss the logistics of the project prior to lodging your application. And those contact details will be provided to you at the end of this presentation. 
There are many costs to running a measured soil carbon project, including mapping, independent drafting or reviewing of a land management strategy, sampling and lab analysis, auditing and preparing offsets reports. Once you've decided that this project is right, you can uh, then uh, prepare your land management strategy, map your project and consider a forward abatement estimate. This will give you a good idea about the potential of the soil carbon increase uh, and the amount of accuracy you'd be able to generate during the lifetime of the project. You'll need to measure your baseline soil carbon levels and start delivering carbon abatement by implementing your new land management activity. I'll talk about how abatement is measured in a moment. But once the project is registered, uh, you would want to then uh, measure your baseline uh, soil carbon uh, as early as possible uh, and then begin your new management activities. Finally, after you've been doing your activities for a certain amount of time, you would then do another round of sampling, which we call subsequent sampling. You'd be able to calculate the amount of carbon that you've sequestered since the new activity was taken place. You'll have the offsets report and project audited and then submit your offsets report uh, to my team for assessment. Uh, and then based on your offsets report, uh, that is then how many ACUs would be generated <clears throat> and credited to you. Once you're ready to deliver your project, you'll have to start with some baseline soil sampling so you can measure those initial soil carbon levels. A baseline sampling round may only be conducted after the project is declared eligible. Soil sampling involves taking samples from randomly allocated locations from your project area and analysing them. This is usually done with a soil sampling machine that drills into the ground and extracts a soil core. The samples must be taken to a depth of at least 300 millimetres. You will likely need to engage a soil technician to assist with the sampling the soil cores must be analysed by an accredited laboratory. There is also mapping guidelines and soil sampling guidance on our website. Uh, once you have registered and completed baseline sampling, you can begin your new land management activities to encourage an increase in soil carbon. You need to conduct a land management activity in each of your CEAs for the duration of your permanence period. That can be either 25 years or 100 years. The next time you'll do some soil sampling will be after you do your land management activities for at least one year after the baseline. This is when you measure the changes in soil carbon and your carbon credit earnings can be delivered. You'll need to do at least one subsequent sampling round each time you report on your project. The three steps in subsequent sampling are the same as baseline sampling, except you won't need to remap your project area. You'll need to create a sample plan and determine your sample locations. You'll need to engage a soil technician to extract the soil cores and then get laboratory analysis of the soil to determine the soil carbon content. Calculating the change in soil carbon levels compared to the baseline is known as the net abatement amount. It's how you determine how many carbon credits you will receive after you report. Carbon abatement calculations uh, can be complex and you may want to consider technical assistance from consultants or specialists. In summary, you need to calculate the trend increase or decrease in soil carbon levels from your baseline to the time you're ready to report a few years later. You then need to calculate the difference in average project emissions, such as fuel use, fertilizer application, livestock numbers, between the project period and the baseline period. This quantity captures increases in project emissions since the project started. For example, if, uh, if more fuel is used uh, for the project compared to the baseline period, the project emissions will increase. Uh, and from there, you calculate the change in soil carbon minus any increase in the project emissions to get the net abatement net abatement amount and that determines how many carbon credits or ACUs you're issued.
Undertaking carbon farming activities alongside your existing operations can bring many benefits. You can diversify your revenue, there'll be co-benefits to your farm. Uh, you, the ecosystem health can regenerate and improve. And then you may understand your soil better to more effectively use, use your soil's nutrients. So the issuance of an ACU is of course a major benefit just returning to that project life cycle diagram, you can claim carbon credits each time you submit your offsets report if you're reporting an increase in measured soil carbon. Each carbon credit represents one tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent greenhouse gas emissions stored or avoided. The carbon credits earned can be sold to the Australian government or to companies and other private buyers via the ever-growing private offsets market. It's worthwhile learning about the options we run uh, for the uh, for the ERF twice a year. I've included a link on the next slide to the options uh, information on our website. It talks about securing government-based carbon abatement contracts. We offer optional delivery and fixed delivery contracts. Optional contracts, for instance, are making up a growing share of new contracts and can help you manage your investment risks as abatement can be purchased by either the Commonwealth or other purchasers. You get to look for the best deal. Uh, there's some links and emails, uh, uh, contact information on this slide. I'll make sure to get a version of this presentation to Rowan, who can then distribute it to you all. Um, the top link will be the measurement of soil carbon sequestration, which uh, has our guidance materials, legislative requirements, information on eligible and restricted activities, soil sampling guidance, and it's all on our Clean Energy Regulator website. And there's also a link there about participating in ERF auctions. Uh, if you have any generic inquiries about the Emissions Reduction Fund, um, please send them through to inquiries at cleanenergyregulator.gov.au or phone 1300 555 542. Or if you have any questions specifically about the soil carbon measurement method, uh, my team's email is listed there at cer-erf soil savannah and agriculture at cer.gov.au. Just watch that uh, double A in the middle there. Sometimes that second A in and gets missed and we don't end up getting that email. That's it for me. Um, I would be happy to take on any questions that anybody has, if there are any. Yeah, great. Thanks, Luke. There, there's. I did have a few written, but uh, I, I think the audience has got some probably better worded ones than what I can bumble through. So I might uh, pass up a bit of narrowly and uh, get some of those questions that the audience has put to us. Yeah. Thanks for that, Rowan, and thanks, Luke. That was a great presentation. There have been a few questions that have come in, and one is from Sharon. She asks, um, what are the chances of the average farmer being able to navigate this carbon credit process, Luke? It looks a bit costly and complicated. So are, you, are people able to talk to companies that act as intermediaries? And if so, what might that cut be for their profit? Or what's the cut um, to profits if you have to go through an intermediary? Yeah, sure. Uh, I agree. It's, it's, it's very complex. There's a lot of... Um... <laughs> There's a, there's a lot to navigate um, and there's multiple pieces of legislation and, and guidance material that's out there. Um, this would be a business decision. Uh, if, you've, if you've felt confident enough to navigate through the ERF yourself, um, you're more than welcome to work directly with the CER, uh, myself and my team. Uh, if you were to go through uh, a third party, um, the costs, that would be a pro, uh, a uh, professional contract, a, um, a personal sort of arrangement between yourself and that party. So it's, I, I wouldn't really be able to sort of give even a spitball figure about what those costs would be or how much of, a, of an impact it would have on your business. Uh, however, if, if you were to concentrate on the land management strategies yourself and have that assistance from somebody, um, there are options out there. You can hand over the uh, 
uh, what we the legal right to the uh, to a to a project proponent. Uh, you can be the proponent yourself and get an agent to help you, or you can hand over all those rights to a third party and they can pay those accu uh, accus back to you. Um, there's many arrangements that you can have. Um, I think the Carbon Market Institute would be a good place to start if you wanted to uh, look at uh, possibilities of scoping third parties to give you that kind of assistance that you'll be looking for. Um, today was specifically on soil carbon, but uh, my team also looks after agricultural and savanna burning methodologies. So uh, those third parties would also be helping um, land managers operate those um, those kinds of projects as well. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, Luke. Um, there's another question that's come in for you, and this one's asking um, if someone already has a high base level due to their good past management practices, how could they still participate and benefit in this program? Well, yeah, I guess um, the the method is based on a measured increase in soil carbon. So if your carbon stocks are already high, um, there's nothing stopping you from participating. Um, however, that would be up to you to determine whether that you think that your soil carbon increases um, that could be credited would outweigh the costs that would be involved in the project itself. Um, it's uh perhaps you would consider if the soil carbon methodology would be the one for you specifically uh perhaps there would be another methodology under the rf that you could participate in uh, but if you're really keen on increasing that soil carbon level and participating under that method uh it, again it would be a, a personal circumstance that you'd need to determine whether the um the benefits of participating would outweigh the costs Okay, great. Thank you for that one. Now, the next question could uh, be answered by you, Luke, or also Susan, but I'll put it out there. And um, Luke, if you want to, you can pass it on to Susan, whatever. Um, as a farmer who's looking to change practices to increase um, organic carbon for productivity only, what testing or records um, could this farmer be conducting now to be able to take advantage of carbon trading in the future? So it sounds like they're focusing on improving their soil organic carbon now just for their productivity, but they also want to know what could they be doing or testing now as a baseline to maybe take advantage of that in the future? Yes, that's not not so much my forte. Um, I don't, Susan, if you have anything that you'd be able to add uh, to that question. So is the question around kind of generating kind of accus that you may or may not use in the future, sorry, narrowly? Is that what? It seems like that. It looks like the focus for them right now is just increasing soil carbon for productivity gain, but they also yep. want to be prepared for future if they want to trade that later down the track. Yeah. Right. So, look, I think it's around kind of registering the CEA and doing that. So I'll leave that one for you to. Sure. Okay. Um, as, uh, the um, if, if you're if you're doing some kind of practice at the moment to get that co-benefit from the increased soil carbon, um, I'd encourage you to continue to do that. Uh, however, what we have there is a concern around what we call newness. Uh, perhaps you're uh, rejuvenating a pasture, which is one of those permitted activities under the method, uh, and then. If you wish to then, <clears throat> if you wish to then uh, participate uh, under the method, you would have to do the rejuvenating of the pasture as well as something else on top of that to be eligible and meet that newness requirement. Um, so if you're building soil organic carbon now, um, what you would be doing is sort of increasing that baseline um, measurement. Uh, and then when it comes to measuring later on and you've done that additional activity, um, the hope would be there that the 
additional activity would see a sharper increase in that soil organic carbon content. Um, so the the sort of short of it is the what the carbon you're increasing right now wouldn't be able to be credited in any way. It would become part of your baseline measurement. Perfect. Great. Well, um, to, I'm sorry, I can't see who has posted that question, but if there's any more clarification, um, they can type that into the questions field and I can um, add to that if you would like. Um, we have had quite a lot of questions coming in um, over the course of today's webinar. Uh, Rowan, it might be best if we maybe try and put together a question answer sheet that will go along with the recording when we email that out at the um, later in the week, potentially, because there are quite a few to get through. Just to keep it to time, how many more questions would you like me to put forward, Rowan? Yeah, I think we are we are sort of running out of time. I just see that it's um, one minute past one at the moment. So feel free to, to finish up there. Uh, thanks so much for our presenters. Um, as Nerely has just said, we probably will try and put, uh, put those questions that we've got dozens that have come in. So we certainly won't have time for them now. Um, so just to... Uh, to, to finish up rather, I think. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to give a big thank you to both Luke and, and Susan. Um, really appreciate their time today. Uh, and yeah, really congratulate them on their, on their presentations. There's a lot of interest in this topic, so it's, it's good to see such interaction. Uh, before we go, I'd just like to give a quick plug to some upcoming LLS events. Uh, so the, just please be mindful to, that you still have to register for webinars two and three in the Soil Carbon for Your Farm Business series. Uh, you'll find these links in the chat box. Uh, another event, uh, Suze, I believe you're actually presenting at this one. So the, the Greater Sydney Local Land Services uh, invites landholders to uh, a soil carbon field day this Friday. And please also uh, join us for a two-part webinar series exploring annual temperate pastures. Uh, and that's presented by Dr. Belinda Hackney with Central West LLS. So if you're interested in that, please find the details on the LLS website. Uh, so that wraps things up for today. We, again, we'll, we'll pass out uh, all of our uh, contact details and information in uh, follow-up emails. So uh, I'd just like to thank you. Thank you all for your time. Great.